Good morning. It's Thursday morning and we are going to be engaged here shortly in our time of devotions. I would invite you to pray with me. O God, from whom all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works do proceed, give to your servants that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and also that by you, we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may pass our time in rest and quietness through the merits of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Well, the scripture this morning comes to us from the book of Revelation, chapter 21, verses 1 through 8. And uh, it's, a, it's an interesting passage that is, at the same time, both very positive but also very, um, well, uh, at the end, it it, uh, it darkens down a little bit. And uh, I think it uh, is something that we ought to pay attention to. So let's, let's hear what God had to say through John in the revelation that he gave him. By the way, it is revelation, not revelations. There were a lot of revelations, but overall it was a revelation that God delivered to John. Just a personal pet peeve. Um, <clears throat> sort of like, uh, you know, uh, well, anyway, never mind. Revelation 21, verses 1 through 8. Then I saw, now, okay, let me preface this a bit. John is in a... A state where he's he's not sure if he's there in person, if this is a just a vision that he is receiving, um, but he is seeing heavenly things and he is seeing from a lot of different vantage points as he goes through the revelation itself. He says, "Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more." Keep that in mind. The sea was no more. We'll come back to that. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them as their God. They will be his peoples. And God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. For the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Also, he said, Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. Those who conquer will inherit these things, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the polluted, the murderers, the fornicators, the sorcerers, the idolaters, and all liars, their place will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. May God add his blessing to this reading from his work. <clears throat> I think it's. I think the weather has impacted this even more. So the last few days I've been yawning constantly, and I apologize for that. It's not something I have too much control over. Anyway, not lack of excitement certainly. Um, as we begin to read this passage, one of the things that comes out of it is this promise and warning, essentially from God. And uh, and so if you kind of take it all as uh, as a uh, a combination of his promises, but also his warnings, you know, it, it puts it in perspective. Uh, John starts, and he says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. Now, in, in Jewish thought, we've talked about this before, there were three levels of heaven, but that wasn't like, you know, this is the best level of heaven, and if you're sort of good, you get to go to this level of heaven, and if you're not that great, but you're not going to go to hell, you go to this. That's not it at all. The perspective of heaven, and Paul refers to it as being caught up into the third heaven, which his readers would have understood, at least if they were Jewish, they would have. 
Um, the, the third heaven was the properly the dwelling place of God. That's, you know, that was what that heaven was. The second heaven was really outer space. There was a, the Jews had a sense of the atmosphere, which was the first heaven, okay? And then the second heaven was outer space. And then there was a third heaven, which they really didn't define as being sort of outside of outer space, but it was the third heaven was the dwelling place of God. And, and so, you know, when you see that, now as, as it's being referred to here, uh, it, I believe it really is referring to a totally new creation, a new atmosphere, a new world. The world is going to be completely renewed, changed, perfected. When God got done with creation, what was the thing that he said? He said, it's good. He said, it's not only good, it's very good. And, uh, and again, we've talked about this, but I don't think we can talk about it enough. The fact of the matter is that the world was perfect right up until the point in time at which sin entered. And when sin entered the world, the world began its decline, its deterioration. Now, we should never use that as an excuse on our parts to say, well, it's going to be destroyed anyway, so who cares? So we'll just, you know, abuse the world and the earth and uh, everything in it. Um, we were given the job as caretakers of the world. Certainly Christians uh, ought to be more concerned with that than most people because that is our responsibility is to be caretakers of the world. So we certainly ought to pay attention to those things and, uh, and live responsibly and accordingly. So uh, anyway, the first heaven and the first earth are going to pass away and a new heaven and a new earth will be coming. Coming from where? Um, the, uh, you know, the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. I think the whole earth is, it, it comes from God, God's creative power, God's creative uh, mind. And so, uh, and the sea was no more. Now that's an interesting thing because we, it's hard to think of the world without the sea. Um, but is that exactly what it means, that there isn't going to be any water anywhere? Well, I, I don't really think so. Um, when you look at the sea from the concept of Jewish theology, <clears throat> okay, my understanding is that the sea is sort of the uh, repository of sin and evil and terror and all of those things. Uh, it was considered to be uh, a place that you know, evil came out of, in essence. The world, the, the sinful world was was the sea. Um, and so it wasn't even just so much the water, but the whole concept of all of that stuff became like a sea that was impassable. And, uh, and so, you know, when the sea is no more, exactly what is that saying? Well, I think one thing that it might be saying is the world uh, of sin and evil and corruption and destruction uh, is going to be done, ended, cleaned up, perfected, no more problems, uh, no more issues. The sin will not hold sway. You know, the sea will no longer rule, essentially, uh, over the hearts and minds of human beings. And I think that's really what they're, what is being referred to here. Not may not be in the oceans. I don't know. Maybe just beautiful lakes. You know, I have no idea. Um, but, uh, you know, when we look at the seas today, we see that all this salt water and it has, uh, it, it produces so much life, but by the same token, it's antithetical, uh, to a lot of other life. So it's interesting to think about that, but I think that if you lock into the concept of <clears throat> the sea being the world of sin, uh, which was a definitely a concept that the Jewish people had, you're probably, and, and not just the Jewish people for that matter, uh, but I think that you'll you'll do well if you keep that in mind as a reference point for the sea, okay? Anyway, as you go on, you see the new Jerusalem, the holy city coming down out of heaven from God, and I like this, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. God has prepared new Jerusalem uh, to be essentially the bride of the Lamb. You know, so 
you, you have this, you, and, and again, I don't think that, you know, we're going to be married to Jesus kind of thing. All right. That's not what's being said. But I think that in terms of God's uh, attempts to help us to understand the whole concept of his love, you know, he, he gets at the most um, responsible choice of love, uh, the best choice of love that human beings can attain to, and that is uh, choosing someone to marry and loving them and living with them and giving your life to them. And in some cases, giving your life for them, in, es in essence. And, and so, you know, if we have children, there's uh, ideally at least, and certainly not in every case, but there is ideally at least a sense of that natural love, you know, that you just, you can't escape. Whereas when we're talking about a marriage, we're talking about two people who make decisions. Decisions based on love. Now, the theme for the week is God, our source of hope. And, and so as we, uh, as we look at this, we see, you know, God filling his people with hope. And, and uh, when you are a bride and bridegroom, I don't know about you, but when I got married to my wife, and I, I hope that she would say amen if she was sitting behind me, which she is not uh, sitting behind me. She might say amen anyway. But <laughs> the reality is, you know, we had a lot of hope. We had great expectations. I think we sort of thought we would always get along. It would always be happy. It would always be joyful. It would always be just wonderful. We were going to have perfect kids and we were going to be perfect parents. So how'd that work out for you, Jamie? Well, we'll just leave that right there. Anyway, we had, we had hopes. We had hopes. And so the bride is prepared by God, for God, in essence, uh, and, and, the reality is that uh, that substance of hope that comes in that, you know, we can get an inkling of it. I think that's why God describes it the way that he does, is to give us hope in our relationship with the Lord. And it goes on, it says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them as their God. They will be his people's. And God himself will be with them. Now, let's look at that little section for a minute. You know, the presence of God, and you've heard me say this time and time again, I know. But I'll keep on saying it because I still really feel it. Um, one of the most inspiring or exciting chapters, or not chapters, passages in the, uh, in the Bible revolves around the Garden of Eden and uh, Adam and Eve walking in the garden with God in the cool of the day. You know, as the day is coming to its conclusion and uh, night is uh, getting ready to come, God comes and literally, in some form, walks with them in the garden and talks with them. You know, we, we love that concept so much that the reality is that very few people don't have some sense of the hymn in the garden. You know, I, co I go to the garden alone when the dew is still on the roses and the voice I hear. You know, it, it's God. And, and so we we have a desire for that. We have an understanding of that at some level within our hearts anyway. And so, you know, what God is talking about is going back, not going back, but going ahead, you know, to that day when once again he will walk with us, he will talk with us, he will be with us, dwelling with us as our God. And we will be his peoples. God himself will be with us. Boggles the mind. Because we're not used to that. We dream of it. We think of it. We sing about it. But, you know, it's not something that we uh, have experienced in the same way. And, uh, and what this passage tells us is that we can look forward to it. We can have hope in it. Uh, God is our source of hope. Our relationship with God is is the relationship within which we hope. And, uh, and we don't just hope forlornly. We hope in an absolute and a secure promise, which God has made. 
And then he goes on and talks about what that means for us. You know, with God, God being with us, there are certain things that are, are going to end, that are going to change. It's a new heaven and a new earth. And one of the things we go back to in the Old Testament in, in Genesis, we were not created for death. And again, we've talked about that. You know, for years, scientists looked for some reason why people age. They understood how conception occurred. They understood how gestation went. They understood childhood through maturity. But once the human body hit the point at which it was physically uh, mature, some of us never quite hit the point of, you know, uh, being emotionally uh, mature. But at any rate, uh, once you hit that point, the human body is this wonderful machine that regenerates itself over and 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 over. And uh, we were created for that. We were created to be a, uh, um, you know, our bodies were created to continually fix themselves. And, uh, and we were not created to die. And so they, uh, they couldn't figure out how people got old. That, that, that part escaped them. They, they knew, a whole lot about genetic sequence they knew a whole lot about various things but they could not figure out why people age and then they finally found the gene for aging and it's sort of on the end of a chromosome and it doesn't look like any of the other genes and it appeared in terms of how it looked as if it had been added on as an afterthought and they called it the afterthought gene right up until the point when some bright light suddenly figured out that that coincided too perfectly with the story in Genesis. And it went from being Newsweek and People and you know, every popular magazine had some article about the, you know, they finally found the gene to aging. And when was the last time you heard about that? About three or four weeks after it was first discovered. And you don't hear about it at all. It shut down like the, you know, like... Somebody dropping the drawbridge. It absolutely crashed, and that was all she wrote, and you didn't hear anything more about it. And I wonder why that is. You know? So we were not created for death. That came through human sin. And, uh, and in this new heaven and new earth, God is saying through John, so this is the word of God, and he says, I myself will be with them, and I will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. The problems, the issues, the uh, sin is gone, it is done, and it does not exist anymore. And, uh, and so it goes on, and, and the one who is seated on the throne said, and who is that? God the Father. See, I am making all things new. Also, he said, write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. And then he said to me, it is done. That's the trustworthy and true part. It is done. That's the hopeful part. You know, we have not yet experienced it, but that does not mean that it is fate accompli. It is done done. It is in place. It is not even in terms of uh, uh, human terms waiting, because God isn't limited by time or space. So when God says, this is what I will do, therefore it is done. And in, in our perspective, it hasn't happened yet, and it may not happen in our lifetimes, although you, you sure wonder sometimes, People have wondered ever since the ascension of Jesus when he was coming back, right? Okay, so, you know, we look at that and we think about it. And, and the fact is, though, that God says uh, these words are trustworthy and true. It is done. It is finished. It is completed. And, uh, and it is just waiting for that tick of the second hand to arrive. Now, you know, God created time for us. He created time as a perspective within which we would live, and uh, that was his. That was his doing. God is in control of time. So as you read this and you think about it, it is absolutely trustworthy. It is truth. It is done. It just hasn't quite happened yet, 
but it isn't going to not happen. Absolute truth. And he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. Now, it's interesting because, you know, the, he talks about the first things are done. Um, when God speaks about stuff like that, there's not, not a lot of reference to the in-between. It is the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And, uh, and so it, it's like the stuff in between, again, fits into this time conundrum, if you will. Um, you know, it, it's like God, this is where, this is the first, this is the final. In between, it's all process to get to the final. In absolute, you know, knowledge of God, understanding of God, the power of God. And, uh, and so, again... Those are things that ought to give us an awful lot of hope because God will not be stymied. You know, sin, in effect, stymied God, if you will, uh, but God already knew it was coming, so he didn't get fooled by sin, and he set in place before he ever laid the foundations of creation or you know the first human being came to be in any way, shape, or form, God already had a plan for redemption. Again, you know, not subject to time. God knew everything that was going to happen. And he prepared and made a way for us to turn back to him in love and, uh, and as children, as his children. And he goes on, he says, uh, you know, I'm the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega. To the thirsty I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. So it will be living water. Uh, those who conquer in this life, and say that specifically, but in this life, those who conquer, where are we conquering? Um, we're we're going to conquer in this life. Those who conquer will inherit these things, all of this good stuff, all of this relationship with God, all this new heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem. Uh, and uh, And I will be their God and they will be my children. Now, the truth is that we live within that promise even now that we belong, if in fact we have accepted Christ, we belong to God. And we're living in that relationship with God. Um, they, uh, they will inherit these things. I will be their God. They will be my children. And, and in the final sense, it's going to be that perfected relationship. So those are the folks who conquer. Those are the folks who relate to Christ and, and reject the, uh, the, the sin that is so prevalent in the world today. Now, that doesn't mean that we are perfect here and now, because we're not. Um, there is, but there's only one unforgivable sin, and that's blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, which, in my understanding, means dying while you're still rejecting the truth that the Holy Spirit is telling you that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And is the only way to get to God. So, you know, if we reject that as we are alive, uh, we're calling the Holy Spirit a liar. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. And so blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, that's the that's the premise of it. So the the truth is that uh, we we try, we fail, we get back up and keep on trying because we are enabled to do that by God Himself and by our reliance on him. But there are those who will refuse that alliance, reliance rather, um, and alliance, I guess you'd have to say too. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the polluted, the murderers, the fornicators, the sorcerers, the idolaters, and all liars, uh, and now if you look at that, you, you can see that every single one of those things that is lifted up is a place where people essentially seek power from other sources than God. E even the cowardly, what are they? They're seeking to escape. They're seeking the power to escape from whatever it is that confronts them. And uh, the uh, the faithless, I refuse. I refuse to put my faith in God, and uh, and instead I will take care of myself. I will be my own God. Thank you very much. The polluted. I would prefer this over God. 
the murderers. Again, I can control myself and I can control other people even to the point of killing them. Now remember that the whole concept of murder isn't limited to a physical act wherein someone dies. You know, there is that sense of uh, destroying people premeditatedly. Um, murder means murder. It is a premeditated act. It is It, it extends beyond what um, the law says, you know, um, because when we plan these things out, when we commit to those sorts of things, when we commit to the destruction of another person, whether it ends in their physical death or not, um, there is a murderous intent in that. The murderers, the fornicators, power over other people in whatever way, sexually, in, in terms of the fornication, that's really primarily a sexual attitude. The sorcerers, getting their power through some sort of dark force, you know, tapping into Satan's power and using it for their own benefit. One of the interesting things about Satan, and I've seen it more than once or twice in my own life and ministry, is that he will, he will empower people. No question about it, he will. Right up until the point in time at which they think they're in control, and he can't stand that. And so they get to a certain point, and what happens? Well, they get killed, or they, uh, you know, they wind up in prison for the rest of their lives. They think they've got power, you know, and the reality is that uh, Satan will only give you enough power to hang yourself, you know, and that really is the truth. The idolaters. You know, looking for control in your life. I want this item, this item, this item, and this item. These are the things that are important to me. Or um, I want power here. I want something here. And, uh, and we put those things before our relationship with God. God comes in a very distant second if he's even in the race. And uh, all liars. I can control things around me by lying, by changing the truth, by telling it from my perspective and ignoring uh, any other perspectives. And, uh, you know, that's how I can control my life. <clears throat> you see, all those things have to do with attempting to gain power or control at some level um, that really ultimately only belongs to God. Their place will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. So, um, you know, it's, it is a choice, obviously, uh, that they are making. It's a choice that you and I make. It is a choice that we make essentially every day. Now, we all have been guilty of sin. We all have access to forgiveness, but we need to take advantage of that. We need to seek it out. Uh, this Sunday, uh, my, my sermon is entitled, uh, What are you seeking from, you know, from God? Why are you seeking God? What do you want? And, um, and what this passage tells us is less about what we want than it is about what God wants for us. Okay, it isn't, this doesn't say you've got to be a perfect little boy or girl in order to gain what I have in store, what I have planned. It is not that at all. It is something altogether other. This, God says, this is what I want my children to have. This is what I want you to rejoice in. And you can reject it. It's very clear in that passage that you can reject what it is that God wants to give you. But make no mistake, you know, God wants to wipe away every tear from your eye. God wants to end the death. God wants to do these things that are a blessing for his children. And the only thing that stands in the way of that ultimately, folks, is our hearts and, uh, and for us personally. And then as we personally find our hearts in united with Christ, we find that our hearts are united in Christ and we become the church. Well, will you pray with me? 
May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen. All right. Have a great day. We'll see you tomorrow and uh, hopefully at the normal time. <laughs> Bye-bye.